Hello, Global Gardeners. Happy Monday as we start another gardening week and talk gardening to you and to me and to all the rest of us. So nice to see everybody checking in already. Today's topic is going to be weeds. My philosophy of weeds may differ from yours, but that's okay because that's one of the things about weeds is it's a recognized task in gardening, trying to get rid of our weeds. But maybe by the end of today, you'll recognize you don't need to be working as hard to get rid of the weeds because there's a lot of beneficial aspects to the weeds that we are growing. And for those of us that like to be lazy as often as we can in the garden, weeding is one of those activities that if we approach it with the thought that not every weed is bad, suddenly it's not as hard a task and becomes much, much easier. So hello to everyone who's checking in. I'd like to say thanks to Heidi and Jay right off the bat, our wonderful moderators that help keep everything on track. And all the rest of you, of course, as you are asking and answering your questions along the way. So the sharing of information in the Gardner Scout community is just incredible. Gardens Happen is saying, I let some of my weeds grow especially the edible ones. Thank you for that, because that's how I actually want to start off today, is the idea that a weed might actually serve a purpose by being edible. So, right up front, what is a weed? My definition of a weed is any plant that's growing in the wrong location. And it really doesn't matter what that plant is. If it's growing in a spot that you don't want it growing in, it's a weed. But if it's growing in a location that is okay, even if it's recognized as a weed, it might not be. And so in my garden, my top three weeds, as recognized by most people, are lamb's quarters, dandelion, and purslane very common weeds in many of our gardens. All three of those plants are edible. One of the reasons that they <laughs> became a weed is because they're edible. Europeans brought the dandelion over to the Americas because it was an edible crop. Then it just escaped and took over and many of us see it as a weed if it's growing in the middle of our lawn. But if that same dandelion is growing outside a garden bed, why treat it like a weed? Why not treat it for its original purpose, a food crop? And lamb's quarter, I have all over the place. There are regions of the world that are growing lamb's quarter as a food crop. And the same with purslane. If you live in one of those areas and you've got that, that store that specializes in very unique salad crops, purslane is probably on the menu. So that's a weed as recognized by most of us. But in my garden, I let the purslane and I let the lamb's quarter and I let the dandelions grow unless they're growing in the middle of my vegetable garden beds. And that's the key differentiation when we start thinking about weeds. Plants, especially the edible weeds that are just growing in your landscape, you can use as a garden crop because you can harvest those so-called weeds and eat them. But if they're growing in a location where you don't want them to be, if they're beginning to interfere with other plants, then it's a weed. So that's the basic idea. And that's where I'll be starting from as a foundation in the discussion today is that differentiation. And you're the only one that can make that decision. Is it a plant that you need to get rid of or is it a plant that might serve a purpose and is doing okay with its current location. And that gets back to the idea of the lazy gardening, because if I can avoid pulling a plant, it saves me work. But let's take that to the next level. If I can avoid pulling a plant and it benefits my garden, 
well, not only have I saved effort, but I've actually maybe made the garden better. I have rabbits in my garden, not as many anymore because Mala is doing a great job to keep the rabbits out. But until Mala came along, I would observe the rabbits eating the lamb's quarter and the purse lane and the dandelions and all of the other edible weeds that are growing in my garden. With the rabbits happy because they had a full diet from all those other plants that were growing outside my raised beds, I never have had an issue with the rabbits getting into my garden beds. And so often if I'm asked the question on how to deal with some of those pests like rabbits, I will encourage that you grow or allow to grow those native plants, those native weeds that might be growing in your area because the rabbits in your neighborhood are probably used to eating those kind of plants. If you have a pristine garden with pristine pathways and it's one of those situations where you don't accept any plants growing outside of a bed and you happen to have the rabbits looking for food, well, their only recourse is to come into your garden beds to eat. But if you allow that food around the edges of your vegetable garden area, then the rabbits are going to be happy and that's one less thing you need to deal with. So, do you want weeds? Do you not want weeds? Do you have those animal pests? Do you not have those animal pests? Do you want to try eating something in your diet that you've never tried before after identifying the plant as edible? That might be something to take your gardening to another level. Marcia Davenport, thank you so much for that super chat. Sorry, not about weeds. My raised gardens have a mean pH of 7.5, a high PI of 212, low KI of 33, and a low SI of 26. How do I begin to correct it? Can I use uh, langbanite? I will add two inches of compost anyway. So I haven't used the langbanite, or langbanite, I think that's how you pronounce it. Uh, but the, the basic approach of compost adding to your bed to improve your soil is an excellent start. You've already done the testing. That's also a very important aspect because knowing the baseline from which you're working is important when you start deciding what to add. One of the nice things about compost and organic material in general is that when you add it to the soil, it begins to buffer the pH. I have very high pH too. I've had gardens that have been close to that 7.5. Most of my garden area is above 7.0. After a year or two, because it can take a little bit of time, after a year of doing nothing but adding compost to my garden beds, I was able to bring the pH down much closer to 6.0 and 6.2 because those, so those soil microbes and all that organic matter in the soil tends to buffer the pH. And it works in both directions. If you have an acidic soil, you can actually raise the pH by adding that organic matter and getting all that life involved. So I'm hesitant to add ingredients to raise the pH, especially when the organic materials can be so effective. And so it does take time. If you want an immediate shift in the pH, then yes, there are lots of things that you can add. Lime is one of the most common things that are, are used by gardeners to sweeten the soil. If you have an acidic soil, you add the lime and that almost instantly raises the pH. The same with sulfur. If you've got a highly alkaline soil like you with that 7.5 pH, if you're looking for almost immediate results, it does take a little while, then you add sulfur to the soil to drop the pH. If you've got time, then the compost and the or organic matter is the method that I prefer. And that's one reason why I, I encourage getting beds and getting soil done the year before you actually plan on planting in those beds. So I prepare my beds in fall for spring planting, and partly it's for that reason, that it takes time for that moderation and that buffering of the pH to, to take effect. So 
uh, quick. Yes, you can add some ingredients, but if you want a more long-term impact, because once the soil pH has changed as a result of adding all of those organics, it's much easier to maintain the nutrients and the pH of the soil from that point forward by just continuing that process on a on an annual basis, adding more organics. So hope that helps. Peter's wondering, what's the best way to deal with weeds that are stuck in a wire fence and are hard and impossible to pull out? And so what I often do with those kind of situations, be it, a, a, and usually it's a fence, sometimes it's something else that, that they're growing into. If you cut them off at the ground so that the stem is killed because it's separated from the plant, I find that dry plants are easier to remove from chain link fences and wire fences than the the living plant. Now there's a period of time you got to wait for that stem and those leaves to die to pull off, but I'm a patient gardener and that's the approach I typically take in those areas where I have those weedy plants that are growing into the wire is I just cut them off and then let them dry out and then they're much easier to pull apart. And I do the same with, and, and I'll mention this when we talk about this photo in the background as well. I do it as well with most of the garden plants that I'm trellising. It's easier to remove those plants later after they've died and dried and they're easier to remove. So be it peas or beans or tomatoes or my my flowers that are growing up my arches, it's easier for me to pull them after they've they've dried out and they usually grab them, pull them, they break apart and then they're done. When they're actively growing, they're much stronger and that, that turgid aspect with all the moisture that's in that plant can make it difficult. Otherwise, you just gotta get in with clippers, with pruners and cut out little pieces and uh, try to get rid of them because it is hard and it's I, I wouldn't say it's impossible to pull out but if you make it easier on yourself by doing it when the plant will break apart when you pull it then it, it's no longer impossible dlr978 nettles make an excellent addition substitute for spinach in dishes like spanakopita filled ravioli oh you're making me hungry pasta dough I was surprised to find nettles in Mediterranean cuisine yeah and so as we as we proceed with the idea of what's a weed and what's not a weed I bought nettle seeds and then I planted nettles in my garden on purpose and nettles for many people are a weed but it also falls into that category of being a food that some people consider delicious it's definitely nutritious and it also can be used to make a, a an extract if you soak those nettle leaves in water and use it to fertilize your plants. So when we look at what we can do with weeds, nettles are a great uh, example because many gardeners are aware of nettles and think of them as weeds. But a nettle tea can be really good in your garden and there are lots of sources out there to tell you how to make nettle tea and how to use those nettles to return the nutrients back to the soil. You can do the same thing with pretty much all weeds. Dandelions, again, remember they're edible. The entire plant is edible and it's packed with nutrients. Well, if you take those dandelions and just put them in a bucket and cover them with water and let them steep for a week or two, that water has now been filled with most of those nutrients that are now leached out of those dandelions. And you can use that as a quick fertilizer to help your soil and help return those nutrients back to the soil. And so think in terms of that as far as the way that you can make weeds beneficial, not just by harvesting and eating them, but actually returning that matter back into the soil. You can also compost weeds. And when I say this, I know there's a lot of gardeners that cringe at the idea of composting weeds. Remember, weeds are just a plant that's growing in the wrong location. So if you're composting the thinnings of your, your, your spinach and your turnip leaves, 
leaves and maybe the beet root that you pulled out to, to thin as well. If you're composting all that material, why not compost the weedy material? The, the issue I think most gardeners don't quite understand is how weeds propagate. And there's no single answer. It's just like all the other plants in our garden. They have different methods of propagation. Some will propagate by the root. And sure, if you compost some of those plants and they're not fully broken down and they're still alive when you use that compost, that little root section might grow and might turn into a weed someplace in your garden. That's not highly likely. But it could happen and I think that's one reason people have heard horror stories how they've used compost and it's spread weeds throughout the garden <clears throat> more likely is that the weeds were composted after they had flowered and after they had set seeds on the plant and if you take any plant and compost it with the seeds on it unless you have a very hot compost pile those seeds are going to survive that composting process. And then when you use that, that compost again, you're going to end up with those plants. I've had radishes pop up in my garden from a compost that wasn't fully decomposed. I've had spinach pop up in my garden because there were seeds from the spinach plants that I composted and they ended up popping up in the rest of the garden. So it's not necessarily the bad weeds as we think of them that you can spread in your compost it's any plant that you add to your compost that has seeds on it the potential is there that that will spread throughout the garden if you chop off the weeds and add them to your compost before they've flowered and before they've set seed then they're not going to spread those plants that require seeds to propagate won't propagate if there aren't any seeds to spread throughout your garden. So I compost weeds all the time. And if they do have the seed heads on them, I'll cut off the seed heads and throw those off to the side to dry out for the birds and then compost just the stems and the stalks and the leaves and the roots. And I don't worry at all about those spreading throughout the garden. Moon Dust is saying, honestly, I guess you can say that cherry tomato can be a weed too. Oh yeah, absolutely. My parents grew some years before and now it comes back every year as a wild tomato. We're pulling them this year when they pop up. Exactly. Tomato is one of those plants that, that gardeners want to be growing and we try very hard to grow our tomatoes, but they can easily escape your garden bed. And especially if you live in a region where the the weather will support tomato seeds germinating and starting to grow. Absolutely, it can easily become a weed and overtake a space. So it's all about the seeds and it's all about how those plants propagate and what happens to them if you allow those seeds to, to grow. Last year, I had that issue in one of my beds as well. I, I typically am not rotating my crops because I'm amending my soil every year. And so in one of the beds, Two years ago now I was growing cherry tomatoes same thing those cherry tomatoes were falling into the bed last year I had different plants growing in that bed peppers primarily and every now and then a little tomato plant would pop up and that tomato plant became a weed I also even though I supposedly only have male asparagus plants some of my asparagus are obviously female plants and asparagus in my garden has become a weed because those little red seed pods of the asparagus will break open and those seeds will blow throughout my garden. And I actually have asparagus popping up 20, 30, and in one case, I think 40 feet away from where my asparagus beds are growing. That's a weed. I try very hard to grow the asparagus in the beds that I'm growing, but when it starts showing up in one of my vegetable garden beds, it's, it's hard. It really is hard to pull out an asparagus plant because it's a weed, but you have to do that. If it's a plant growing in the wrong location, it's a weed.
regardless of where, whether it's an asparagus or a cherry tomato or anything else. And I, I have in the past actually changed some of the purposes of my beds because, uh, and this, this happened at the Galileo Garden, I had a similar issue where we were growing onions and allowed them to overwinter and flower and seed to save those seed seeds and the next year there were the beds on either side of that main onion bed that had onions popping up now we'd already drawn out our garden plan and we were planning to grow other plants in those three beds but so many onion seeds from the year before had fallen and blown and fell next to the or fell into the bed next door that we had onions in all three of those beds. We just changed our garden plan for that year and we grew three beds of onions because nature allowed it to happen. It's easy to look at a situation like that and think, oh, I got onions in that bed. I, I want to be growing tomatoes. I'm gonna pull out all those onions because they're weeds. Absolutely, take that approach or shift and say, wow, I've had trouble growing onions in this garden and look at all these beautiful onions that are sprouting. I'm gonna grow the tomatoes someplace else and I'm gonna let these onions grow. And that's seriously, probably the best onion year I've ever had. And that was, for, and that was from allowing those onion weeds to continue growing in a bed that I hadn't planned on and they worked out perfectly and we had probably close to 100 pounds of, of onions by the end of the season. So you can be flexible with your weeds and you can modify your garden plan if it looks like the weed is winning. And as long as it's not a bad weed in your opinion, go ahead and let some of those things grow. So Red at Hand Spun Hand Woven is saying, what varieties of asparagus do folks suggest? I am going to have a four by six area for asparagus for the first time this year in my soon to be raised beds. I'm thinking millennium. And so uh, it depends on your area. I, I haven't grown millennium in my area, the Jersey variety. So I grow Jersey night and they tend to do well in my area. So the most important thing is to to figure out what your climate will support best of all. and. I always say check with your local nurseries or, or experienced gardeners in your area. But the the Jersey, and there's a couple different Jersey varieties that uh, are readily available at, online and often at, at nurseries. I've seen them in my local nursery, and uh, that's, that's the one I grow. If you're growing another variety of asparagus, throw it out to red. But Jersey Night is the one that, that I grow. And like I said, supposedly they were all male plants when I bought them. And the idea being that a male plant isn't flowering. And so the energy is going into the roots and the spears for the next year. And so generally a male plant will give you more spears and bigger spears and they, then you stay away from the female plants. But I think sometimes the producers and the distributors of these plants aren't sure how to determine what's a male and what's a female. And obviously some of us are, are sold something that we didn't necessarily want. Happens with chickens too. My son just bought his first chickens, chicks this last week. And you see that in the chicken world as well, where you buy a chick that you think will become a hen. And then a few months later, you find out that the chick becomes a rooster. So it happens in the plant world as well. Jay is saying, I tried purslane for the first time last year. By the way, caution with purslane identification, so no confusion with a similar non-edible weed. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I don't typically, well, I don't eat anything until I've identified it. But even when it comes to those things like the lamb's quarter and the purslane, I, I almost always stop, take a real close look and make sure that it is the plant that I think it is before I, I eat it. So that's good advice, Jay. You do want to make sure that you have the, the attention and the focus on that plant to identify it. 
and be sure of the identification before you decide to eat it. Absolutely. Okay, let's see. Annie's Adventures wondering about square foot gardening opinions. How far apart should corn and tomatoes be? I'm working with three 13 by four beds. And so corn uh, is one of those plants that you, it should be grown in blocks. And I, I think the square foot gardening suggests maybe one corn plant per block. And so you can get away with corn being planted about a foot apart. I've had better success with corn being planted about 18 inches apart. And that's actually how I separate my tomatoes as well. I grow my tomatoes vertically. And so by growing them up trellises, they're spaced about 18 inches apart. And so that's, that's a, a nice general number that I use for the bigger plants is 18 inches. Uh, but of course it does depend on, on what you're growing. And if you're growing a, a corn variety that recommends more spacing, then by all means use more spacing. But if you grow them a little bit closer than that, you typically don't have the, the big ears that you're looking for. So, so corn is a pretty needy plant when it comes to the water and nutrition. And so allowing enough space for each of those plants is, is really a good approach to take. So Paul's saying, good day. Good day to you. I really appreciate your work here on YouTube. Well, thank you. How do you control the temperature in a spider farmer tent? Currently, I need to raise it a little bit and can't seem to find a way. <clears throat> and so I've experiment. I've, I've been experimenting with my farmer, spider farmer tent, grow tent. And I have a very small fan. I think I showed it in a recent video of my my setup in my my growth space area and it has a thermostat on it. it it's a heater fan and so that's what i've been experimenting with in my grow tent is to set up a very small fan with a thermostat and then setting it to whatever temperature that you're trying to get and it'll cycle on and off once it reaches the temperature in that grow tent it doesn't cycle much it actually holds the the temperature pretty well and so look into something along those lines, maybe even just a little ceramic heater that you can put into the grow tent. But the key is that it has a thermostat that you can set and then allow that, that temperature to, to remain consistent in the grow tent. And I'm, like I said, I'm still experimenting with it and that little heater fan so far is working pretty well for me. And my, my basement grow area is still very cold. It's the coldest part of the house. And it's still very cold here in Colorado, but inside the grow tent, I'm able to maintain not only the temperature, but the humidity as well. The, the humidity is much better controlled in that grow tent. So hope that helps. Uh, Shandy's Garden says, I'm about to DIY my very first stirrup hoe with some reclaimed metal strapping on an old broken handle. I'm going to stay on top of the little baby weeds by knocking them over while standing. Great idea. And this is a good transition to the next phase when we start talking about weeds. And I love my stirrup hoe. I, I haven't made my own. I, I've seen some videos that show how to do it. So that's great for you to recycle some of those materials in your garden. But that is a great approach. If you have those weeds and you recognize them as weeds and you don't want them in your garden, then getting out there with a hoe and knocking them down when they're still very small, I think is about the most effective way to deal with those weeds. If you let them grow, then they run into problems like winding up through wire fences and then starting to set seed. And if you let your weeds set seed, it's almost impossible to get rid of those weeds in any timely manner. So knock them off with a stirrup hoe. I love my stirrup hoe. I, I, I showed that in a video a couple years ago as being one of my favorite tools. And you can get out there in an open space with a stirrup hoe and clear it of those little seedlings in very little time. So when it comes to control, how much do you want to do? So I'm allowing more and more of my weeds outside my garden beds to grow. But I also have little smaller hand size hand tools that are the like the stirrup hoe and i'll get into my garden beds with that the vegetable beds once the the plants start growing if i have an infestation of a weed and do the same thing just get in there with the the hand hoe and get rid of all of those 
if you make the mistake, as many of us make, where you use hay as a mulch, that often happens. And that's when I've had to do that, where I have used hay as a mulch. Hay typically has a lot of seeds in it. Those seeds then germinate. And now you've got a garden bed filled with hay seedlings. You can get out and pluck them one at a time or get a hoe and just clear out the area in no time at all. But the key is getting rid of those weeds when they're still small and that little bit of damage is all it takes to kill the plant. Later on, you try to hack some of those plants down and they'll just pop right back up. So deal with the weed early and that's usually the best way to, to get rid of them. And yeah, the long-handled Japanese sickles, they're useful for clearing weeds around small nooks. Thank you, gardens happen. I, I agree with that. There's some really cool tools that you can get and absolutely make a big difference. And Joni saying, love my hula ho. That's the, that's one of the brand names for that stirrup ho is hula ho. And yeah, absolutely. It's, it's such, it's fun. I actually, in open areas where I've got those weeds starting to grow, like in open beds, I, I love it. I love getting out there with that hula ho or stirrup ho. Great exercise and you just see them fall to the ground and they're done. So that, that is a, a lot of fun to, to deal with. So uh, nice to have you here, Brian. Don't worry about being late. You know, you can always catch up. That's fun. And so Happy Gardeners wondering, do they still make the hula ho? So um, I, I don't know if it's still being sold under that name, but you can find the same design everywhere. All of the, the big box store garden centers have them. And, and they're actually making them now with different types of metal on the, the blade part, sometimes stronger, sometimes sharper. And so there are a couple different variations. Some will have a little bit of a give to them. Others are very solid. And regardless, they, they all work very well to, to get rid of those weeds. So if you love it, like Carla does, Carla says that, that she loves the, the hula ho as well. Cleared lots of acreage in Central Valley, Arizona. And, and that's the approach I take. It, it, when I'm starting a new bed or I'm moving to a new area, and putting in new plants, I do the same thing. I clear it using that kind of hoe because whatever's growing there is a weed. It's a plant that's going to interfere with whatever it is I'm putting into that space. And so clearing it out is a great way to do it. Another way to deal with a large area, and I'll, I'll probably show this maybe next year. I've got a, an area of my yard that I'm gonna be turning into a, a nice formal herb garden, that's my plan. And you use solarization, you take plastic sheeting and cover the whole area and you allow the sun to essentially bake and kill all the plants that are growing there. And that's another way to save some of your muscle energy from going back and forth with that stirrupo. And you just lay out the plastic and kill everything underneath and then come back and put in whatever the plants. So I, I haven't done a lot of solarization. I've done some in small areas, but of course I wanna do it and make a video so that I can demonstrate how that's one method, but probably be next year that I work on that video. We'll have to wait and see. So Jay says the hula ho is still available from a number of sources. So thank you for that. That's a, a good suggestion. Jay's always on top of things. <clears throat> and so, as we as we look at the the propagation of weeds, talked a little bit about throwing them into the compost pile. Do recognize and and try to identify what you might think of as a weed before you automatically assume that it is being propagated from one method or another. One of the most common questions I get because my most popular video is how to fill a raised bed. And in that bed, I basically just fill the bed and and show how I use the logs at the bottom and, and different blends of soil on top. And the question I get more than any other is about the weeds. How, how do I deal with the weeds with in my raised beds? And so recognizing how plants grow, and again, it really helps to identify the plants that you think of as weeds. But if you smother 
virtually any plant with 18 inches of soil, it's going to kill the plant. Plants need the air, plants need the, the sun, and plants need the water. And if you can't get all three of those things, then the, sun, the plant's going to die. Well, underneath 18 inches of logs and soil, those plants aren't getting any sun, they're going to be smothered, and they're going to die. And so when I create my new raised bed areas, sometimes, depending on the plant, I'll dig it up and I'll dig up that ground and I'll turn it upside down and I'll allow what's the roots now on top exposed to the sun, I'll allow those roots to die, to be baked by the sun, and then I put my raised bed in place. And I do that for some of those weeds that are propagated by roots. And so by digging them, turning them upside down, allowing those roots to be killed by the sun, and then putting the raised bed in place, I have less likelihood that those weeds will grow in that bed. But even if some of those roots do begin to grow, once they're buried by, and I say 18 inches, most of my beds are actually closer to 16 inches, but because I've dug down a few inches, it ends up being 16 to 18 inches of soil. Once they're buried, the likelihood of those plants growing up through all of that soil and now becoming a weed is greatly reduced. And even if it does travel all the way up through the soil and emerge, once you recognize the, the importance of plant identification within an individual bed. So if you have an individual bed and you're growing tomatoes or carrots or whatever plant in that bed, you learn to recognize what those plants look like and what the seedlings look like. And then if a completely different plant appears, it's probably a weed because you didn't put that plant in place. And it could possibly, very remote possibility, be one of those plants that was at the bottom of the bed when you first put it in place. No problem. As soon as you see it appear, get rid of it. Clip it, pull it, whatever it takes. Because that plant has expended an awful lot of energy to grow up through all of that soil. And if you deprive it of photosynthesis, that plant is gonna end up dying out. So I don't worry too much about getting rid of my weeds most of the time if it's just a regular grass in our place we've got fescue is our most common grass or kentucky bluegrass you can put a raised bed directly on top of that grass and then cover it with soil and that's enough to kill that type of grass that's not enough to kill grasses like bermuda grass that's why it's important that you recognize what kind of grass you have but you can add more beds to your garden often with very little effort if you recognize how the plants grow and what the plants are in that location when you first put the, the raised bed in place. So again, I, I don't like to work any harder than I have to when it comes to dealing with plants growing outside of my raised beds. I just let them grow. I let them grow. Yvonne posted a picture in the Gardner Scott Community Facebook earlier um, today or yesterday, I think it was, and it was discussing creating a small prairie space in your garden. And it's, it's the same basic idea as we talk about allowing weeds to grow. Often, wherever we live, those weeds are native plants. Those are the seeds that are being blown in or being dropped by the birds. And so you can often create a a pretty nice looking area in your garden by allowing some of those native plants to grow and and essentially become a prairie. I live just on the western edge of the prairies of the United States and I have beautiful wildflowers that pop up every year in my yard and, and all of my neighbors yards because they're prairie flowers. They're native to the area. By allowing those kind of plants to grow, you're creating a nice naturalized prairie setting within your garden. And so sometimes you can actually train the, the so-called weeds 
by seeing them pop up in different areas and letting them stay in that area. If there are weeds someplace else, sure, deal with them. But if it's an open area that really doesn't matter, you haven't developed it yet, you haven't put beds in place, you don't know what you're gonna do with it, think about that aspect. Allow some of those native plants that are already in your area to seed naturally and grow naturally. A lot of times those plants don't require any extra attention from the gardener. That's one reason why I like doing that. Until I get my whole garden built out, bare soil is not a good idea. I like my soil being covered. It really helps with the soil life. It really helps that soil build into good nutrient rich soil. It doesn't matter what kind of plant it is. The plant just needs to cover the soil. Well, if it can be a native plant that will survive on my natural rainfall and will survive through my harsh winters and my harsh summer sun and I don't have to do anything extra, well, that sounds like an ideal garden plant. So it's no longer a weed. It's a plant that has a home in my garden because it's got a nice flower and it's got some pretty foliage and it's helping the soil improve. So you might want to tweak your definition of weed as you start seeing some of the plants pop up in your garden. And like I said earlier, it's food for the rabbits and the gophers and the voles that I have in my garden as well. So weeds are not necessarily a bad thing. Vanessa's garden says, I hope my zinnia flower seeds from last year come up like weeds, but I can't tell if what's coming up is zinnia seedlings or something else. And so there you go with the plant identification. And I, I talked about that in a couple of videos this last year um, with my, my cosmos in particular. And that's what I had done the year before, was just let my cosmos seeds. I had some zinnias starting to pop up later in the season, and I'm looking forward to more zinnias as well this year. And it's, it's looking at the leaves and recognizing as a seedling what that plant's going to look like. And so once you start growing more and more zinnias, you can recognize what that, that plant looks like. And if it's a zinnia or a cosmos or whatever plant you're trying to grow and you see that, you let it continue growing because that's what you're looking for. But if something else pops up and doesn't match the leaf shape or the leaf color or the leaf style, then you can recognize it as maybe being a weed that could interfere with those other seeds germinating and beginning to grow and you can get in there and, and do some of the, the weed mitigation. And a lot of times, and, and I still do this, if, if I'm not sure, I'll let it grow and, and then wait until it gets to that point where it's becoming a full-size plant flowering. Maybe I begin to recognize it before it flowers, but that's another way to figure out what's growing in your garden is just let it grow. And you may be surprised. I've, I've got some of those native flowers that are now growing in my garden that I spent the first two years trying to get rid of because I was planting other plants in those spaces. And those plants just kept coming back. And so a couple, it's been a little over a year ago now, a year and a half ago now, I guess, that I said, okay, you obviously want to grow in this space. I'm going to let you grow. And it ended up being just a very low plant with beautiful blue flowers. And I, I honestly don't know what the plant is. I haven't taken that step. I just know that it's native to my area and it's beautiful and I'm letting it grow in the spaces that it has chosen to grow because it really is a nice plant and it's not interfering with the rest of my garden bed. So maybe this year I'll make a point to try to identify some of those weeds that I have that I like. But remember, it, I don't think of them as weeds now. I think of them as a part of the garden. And there's a lot of stuff I grow that I forget what it was that I planted and I don't know the name of it. So it, I'm just happy with the flowers that end up being produced or the benefit that they're offering the garden and don't always need to know the name. I'm going to be working on a video this week with my granddaughters where I'm going to be making more and more plant tags because that's the issue I have. I just get go crazy and I plant and I grow and then a couple years go by and I forget what the what the plant was or what the specific variety was. 
I'm going to really try hard to start labeling more and more of my plants. But I'm growing just to have fun growing and to make things look good with, without necessarily knowing what it is I grow. And uh, the identification really, you know, speaking from experience, the identification makes a difference. So don't do like I do where I just get lazy and grow just for the fun of growing. Do try to remember what it is you're growing and the plant labeling does make a difference in that respect. Dusty Flats is saying, wish nonstop begonias were weeds. They are growing so slow. Yeah, I, I hear you. There's so many of the plants I am trying to grow that I'd, I'd love for them to become weeds. But be careful what you wish for because sometimes those weeds can take over once they do get established. And that's one of those things that uh, we have to be careful about. I know in my area, uh, we have the noxious weed list, and your area probably does too. You can check with your, your county or city, and they probably have a list of the plants they identify as noxious weeds, those weeds that have taken over. And many of them started off as garden plants that gardeners wanted because they were prettier for whatever purpose, and then they found a climate that was ideal for them, and they exploded. And now you have mitigation efforts by county governments, like in my area, that uh, try to get rid of those plants. And, and there's, there's actually uh, fines involved for some, for some of these plants, some of these noxious weeds. And they'll have patrols going through neighborhoods. And if they find you've got that plant growing in your landscape, they'll tell you to get rid of it. And if they come back, whatever the time frame is, and see that it's still growing, you can be fined. So some localities take weeds very seriously. And just be aware of that as you're choosing your plants, especially the ones that you want to just take over. Do be aware of that it's okay within your garden space for them to be taking over and do what you can to try to keep them from escaping into your neighbor's yards. You, know, you don't want to be responsible for a future noxious weed that will be identified on some poster and they're probably not going to be able to trace it back to you, but you don't want to go there. And so, Semen Surfer, my goats eliminated the dandelions by eating the flowers before they seeded. There you go. And, that, and that's a very effective way of dealing with any plant that you see as a weed is uh, not necessarily get goats. If you've got goats, let them do it. But that's the idea, just like any other flower you're growing. If you cut off that flower before it goes to seed, you're stopping the propagation. You're, you're stopping that plant from growing the next year. Dandelions and, and other perennial weeds will come back for a number of years, depending on the plant. But cutting off those flowers is a great way or eating off the flowers. You, and you can actually eat the flowers as well. That's how you make dandelion wine. Take those flowers and use them for other purposes. But that's a good way to keep those plants under control. So yeah, zippity doo -dah. Love rent a goat for a day service. We actually have a uh, an area here in Colorado Springs that right now they do exactly that. There's actually a rent a goat company, and it it's one of our park areas and and it's turned. They do plantings later in the year, but at this time of year they rent the goats and the goats come in and they eat all of the weeds that are starting to pop up. And then they go into the rest of the season, and I guess the goats move to somebody else's property that have rented them for a day. So if, if you're at all thinking about goats, there might be a goat service near you. Uh, it's, it's a business opportunity if you've got goats to rent them out. Hey, Jay, Hanoxa weed fine happened to a local gardener that I know. Sadly, they still had a bad attitude and didn't learn from any information nor fine. Yeah, so I, I guess Jay has that issue as well. There are a lot of areas that have those kind of fines. And I had a neighbor, uh, Russian olive is actually a noxious weed here in my area. And he has a, a Russian olive, I don't think he still has it, but he had a Russian olive tree growing in his front yard. And I pointed out to him that it was illegal for him to be growing that. And he loved it, said, oh, whatever. And they came and 
they issued a citation and said get rid of it and I think they came back later and were going to fine him but he's a real nice guy he's in his 80s and I think he talked his way out of it by showing them that he was going out to cut down the tree that day but some some municipalities are serious about the weeds and yeah they could definitely be fined and often like with your neighbor and with my neighbor they don't understand the reasoning behind it all they know is they've got a plant that they don't want to get rid of but it's often best for the community to get rid of it jeremy says raspberries growing on my side of the fence are fruit if they migrate next door they might be seen as a weed absolutely you know and i was abs i was actually concerned about that when i first started growing raspberries about 20 years ago now the house i had i was growing them along a fence and they did great they loved that location and i was actually getting concerned about them becoming a weed on the other side and went to my neighbor we were very friendly with our neighbors and i offered and did went back to the backyard and dug up and cut down all the raspberries on their side of the fence as they were appearing because they could have easily taken over i love them as a food as well as a wonderful fruit on my side of the fence but your your neighbor may not appreciate it the same way so it is always nice to be uh, aware of all of that so gina says there's evidence that wild plants hence weeds have different and often higher nutrient density than cultivated plants very beneficial for health yeah absolutely and so if you can uh, identify weeds there was a i forget which club it is i think it's our native plant society that we have here uh, periodically we'll have a class where they walk through parks and and different areas around the city and we'll point out those native plants that really are nutritious and often delicious but they're seen by weeds when they pop up so that's another one of those things you might be able to find in your area is it might be through the master gardener program it might be through some type of garden club but you might be able to find a class that, that points out those kind of native plants that that really are good and yes i've seen some research along those lines as well that that many of those plants are packed with nutrients and when you think about how weeds how these native wild plants are developed they serve a purpose their purpose is to turn bare ground into fertile ground and so you'll start off and there's there's all different types of plants and they're they're often called pioneer plants and so you have bare ground and these first weed seeds will blow in and they're the kind of plants that can grow in a very harsh environment bare ground being baked by the sun and the wind is blowing and you have all of the snow or rain the plants that can survive in that environment are the first native plants that are going to grow and they're often very small ground covers well those ground covers serve a purpose because the next phase will be seeds that blow in of the taller plants and the plants that tend to be more nutritious and what they'll often do have is a a deeper root that will bring nutrients from deep in the soil up into the plant so that now as that plant dies and drops onto the surface those nutrients are now being transferred back into the soil but instead of being deep in the soil they're now much closer to the surface of the soil and then the next phase of plants or plant seeds blow in and before you know it you've got trees and bushes and shrubs growing in that same space well some of those interim plants who who have who their plants they have a purpose of exchanging the deep nutrients in the soil to become shallow nutrients in the soil and those are often the edible plants that we're talking about here when you identify those kind of plants they're packed with vitamins and so eat them i'm personally not a big fan of some of these native plants that that i'm allowing to grow and it's just because i'm not a big vegetable eater but 
they can often be served in salads and like spinach in particular and we all have them you just need to identify them because all over the planet we have this process of soil being developed into good soil over time the way nature does it and you just have to figure out at what point you have the plants that can be harvested and instead of being replenishing the soil you're replenishing your diet with those same kind of plants so something to think about john jude is saying sunflowers are great soil building plants absolutely <clears throat> and i haven't shown them yet i was going to do a video last year and ended up not doing it um, but i've got sunflowers growing in my front yard for that purpose i'm really trying to build the soil in my front and and sunflowers can be a really great soil building plant and there's a lot of them that fall into that category so think about those kind of things as you're as you're thinking about weeds and your soil and your garden in general and especially if you're trying to lessen how much work you want to do a little bit of of study and knowledge can make a big difference and so jay saying consider also that weeds can be an indicator species about garden issues absolutely you know it's that same basic idea that that certain plants can grow in certain environments and often the soil in a bare field and the weeds come in well that soil is terrible and and jay's exactly right you can tell by the plants that are growing if that area is deficient in very specific nutrients and if you go to that level of plant identification you can walk into a field you can walk into your backyard and you see some of these plants growing and that's an indicator that you're deficient in in some very specific nutrients because that's where that plant grows and then if you solve that nutrient deficiency well then that plant disappears that's another great way actually to get rid of weeds if you recognize that the weed is only growing there because the soil is deficient in, in a particular nutrient and then you enrich the soil you're getting rid of that weed because now it won't be able to survive the next year in that same soil so uh, weeds and plants in general can just be incredible hi scott nice to have you here today when they clear and scrape a lot here some flowers show up almost immediately yeah, I, some flowers, in fact, um, I've, I've got a number of videos from a couple of years ago where I just let all my sunflowers grow. I, and I did the same thing when I moved here. I scraped my, my backyard to level it out and cleared out all of the, the plants that were growing during that part of the process. And sunflowers were among the very first plants to pop up naturally the next year. And so if you go back to my videos from just a couple years ago, you'll see a lot of sunflowers growing in the background. And I didn't plant any of those. Just like Scott's saying, they just naturally appear because they really are a good soil builder. And it is the way that nature works. When we, when we have a clear spot, it's those kind of plants that are going to move in. Okay, let's see. Let's go. Oh, yeah, there you go. Lily's got a good suggestion, too. Chickens love weeds. And so... Um, my neighbor has chickens. I don't have chickens yet. And last year in particular, uh, we, we were talking over the fence <clears throat> and he was looking at my sunflowers and those blue flowers that I have and a lot of the other flowers that were in my garden. And he was saying, I just, I don't know how you do that. He said a couple years ago, we had all those flowers too, but we don't have them anymore and your yard looks so great well the difference was he added chickens <laughs> to his backyard and the chickens will deal with all of those plants they don't care what kind of plant it is it's just food for them and so i i, I can see a distinct difference between my neighbor's yard and my yard because he's got chickens and the chickens deal with all of those plants before they can reach the point of flowering and becoming beautiful in the backdrop Whereas I don't have the chickens and I can allow that to happen. So yeah, if you've got a weed issue, just like hiring the goats, hire some chickens to come in right about the time that those, those plants start sprouting. And early spring is a time that a lot of those perennial weeds start appearing. 
And so as we're approaching early spring and you start seeing some of those pop up, uh, think about the chickens as an opportunity to deal with some of those perennial weeds and and clear out that garden space that, that you might be concerned about. So uh, chickens are, are definitely an issue uh, in my garden. They, have, they escaped and were tearing up some of my beds to go after the grubs and some of those small plants. It was before I actually had anything planted. But you can do it on purpose because they can be very effective when it comes to, to uh, pulling out those weeds. So, uh, Rachel saying, I get rouge sunflowers all over my yard for my bird seed. Yeah, I've seen a few other mentions of the bird seeds. And the same thing, <coughs> I allow my, my bird feeders seeds to fall. And I have let many of them grow, especially the sunflowers, those those. Uh, black sunflower seeds and so I allow them to grow underneath my bird feeders to give more food for the birds and they're gradually spreading around so um, I was gonna do that video last year and I may do it this year but the idea being that you can grow your own naturalized bird feeder by taking those seeds that you would be feeding the birds and allowing them to grow throughout the garden and allowing them to flower and seed. And now you're providing food for those birds as you go into autumn and winter. So uh, bird, bird feeders can be a good source for some of those. But of course, uh, some of those seeds have found their way into my pots and containers. And at that point, they're a weed. So I pull them. Doesn't matter if they're eventually going to help feed the birds at that moment. It's the wrong plant in the wrong spot and it deserves a home in my compost pile. So it all depends on how much effort you want to do when it comes to those kind of things. And John's talking about the, the chipmunks as well. Uh, at, at the last, my last house, we had a lot of squirrels and uh, that, that was a, not a big issue, but the squirrel, squirrels would often take some of those nuts and seeds from the bird feeders. My neighbors had a 10 or 12 bird feeders and I would often find those plants in my yard. It wasn't always a problem because it wasn't always a weed, but occasionally they would be growing in a spot where they needed to be pulled. Jenny says, I have house sparrows that took over my feeder. They're a pest, invasive, and kill the native birds. They don't like fishing line hanging around the feeder for eyesight. Uh, yeah, if, if you have those invasive plants, and that's, uh, I, I've done that, my last house I did that, where I had the fishing line hanging between posts, and it, that can be a pretty effective way to deal with some of those bird issues. So good for you that you've d discovered how to do that. And so, um, just scrolling up to see if there's something I might have missed that I want to talk about as we deal with this particular issue. It's one of those things that uh, I don't like to weed any more than anyone else likes to weed, which is why I try to learn how to use weeds to my benefit. And if I can do that, now all of a sudden weeding is just a non-issue. It's no longer required. I rarely take that step of propagating and really trying to get some of those native plants to grow. Like I said, if they're growing naturally with the conditions that they're exposed to, I'll let them grow. But it's rare that I'll see a weed and actually make the point to water it or to prune it or to weed around it so that it continues to grow. But you never know. You might discover a native plant that will have a place in your garden, an important place. And if that's the case, now all of a sudden you have to think about weeding the area around what was a weed because it's now lo no longer a weed. And so don't mean to blow your brains up at that point, but that is one of those things to make your mind explode a little bit, how some of these weeds can actually become an important plant. And especially in my area, of the country, I I see a big market in that. Here in Colorado, uh, Colorado State University has done a lot of research on that, and there's some other organizations in Denver in particular. 
and they traveled this whole region, Wyoming, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, and they're looking for those native plants that are growing in the wild and they'll bring them back and they'll start growing and they'll propagate and they'll become garden plants that are sold at nurseries in the whole area. Well, that's a natural transition for beneficial plants that you might even have in your garden as well. Starts off as something you didn't want and before you know it, it becomes a plant that you are paying attention to and propagating and trying to, to help survive in whatever setting you happen to have because I know my garden area is harsh and so sometimes it takes work to get these plants to survive which is why the native plants roll in they're happy they're easy and before you know it you see the same kind of plant being sold in nurseries in your area so interesting way to approach gardening when you think about plants and whether it's a weed or not before I forget let's go ahead and talk about the background that I have today. This is a picture from Richie Morris. And this looks similar to my garden. Right right now I don't have snow and this picture is a little more than a, a month old. So I'm not sure if Richie has snow now or not. But I wanted to point out a few things. First off, I, I love the design of the, of the garden, the beds. We've got these posts, everything is set up. You can see some of the trellises in the background. There's a compost pile in the background barrels for growing, different types of plants in barrels. You've got your cattle panel hoops. There's a lot going on in this, this garden in a relatively small space. But the, the thing I really wanted to point out was there's snow on the ground, obviously a winter picture, and there's still plants in all of these beds. And this is the way I garden. And at the very beginning, talking about how to get rid of weeds that are growing on a trellis, and so you look at some of these trellises that Richie has set up with all of these plants. If you try to pull those plants off of those trellises at the end of the season when they're still alive, it's a lot of work. But if you let them sit all winter long and then in spring go out, I'll put my leather gloves on and on my archways where I have my vining plants growing up it, I just grab them and pull and they immediately separate from the the wire and they break into smaller pieces and they're easy to throw in the compost pile i don't have to worry about any of those plants rooting and becoming weeds at a later point because they're dead and all that foliage is dead and so it's a really i think easy and effective way to deal with garden cleanup when you have all of these trellises and all of these plants and like i said as well with some of those flowers i'm growing I leave them in place all winter long as well as food for the birds. You do need to be aware if you have specific insect pests in your garden and you can identify what those pests are, do learn about the life cycle of those pests because there are some of those insect pests that will overwinter in a garden like this and in a garden like mine where you have the containers with the plants growing and you've got the raised beds with other plants growing up the trellises and there might be insects that like that kind of condition they like growing in that that plant and so i wait for a late winter early spring day before things start growing again and then i'll go out and clean up the, the beds i'll throw all the material into the compost pile even if there is an insect pest that's overwintering in that dead foliage, once it goes into the compost pile, you virtually had eliminated any problem with that pest anymore because the, the, the environment isn't right for that pest when it's buried underneath lots of other organic material and the pile's starting to heat up. So. I, I don't worry about those kind of issues, but you know, I, I like gardens like this. I like seeing the, the plants that are growing and they're covered with snow. You can see there's some trees growing in this bed back here. I, I really like the snow and the frost and the ice that appears on my dead plants in the winter time. You have to clean it up at some point. I was looking out my window yesterday and all my ornamental grasses in my front yard. 
need to be cleaned up because they're going to start sprouting from the base again. And you should do all the cleanup before the plants start growing. But it's the task I put off as, as long as possible before I do it. And uh, the time is coming that I need to do it. But I appreciate this this picture, Richie, because I, I, I like winter gardens and I like that you can see still the plants that were growing. They might be dead, but it helps prompt that little memory of when they were growing. And so all those flowers, those cardinal flowers that I have, and I, I showed some pictures of hummingbirds last year, I still think of the hummingbirds. Even now, when I walk through that area and those plants are toast, I still have that memory that pops into my mind every time I walk under my arch, thinking, oh, those, those hummingbirds were great last year. I'm going to do it again this year with more flowers, and hopefully I'll have more hummingbirds. And so even in winter, you can jog those nice, happy memories in your mind from the previous season or previous seasons. And, and I, I'm not saying you don't or, or you shouldn't clean up. If you like to clean up your garden in fall, go for it. I'm just saying that there are those of us that save it for the spring because we like the look of a winter garden. So appreciate you sharing that. And for all the rest of you, if you have a garden picture you want to share, send it to Gardener Scott at GardenerScott.com and I'll add it to the queue. I have a few more of the winter pictures that I'll be showing in upcoming weeks, but it's getting to be springtime. And I'd love to start showing some of those new growth and green photos in the background and talk about some of those as well. So uh, if you have a picture, if you want to share your garden, go ahead and share that with me because I'd like to see it. And I'd like to talk about it. Dusty Flats never cleans up perennials because it helps protect them over the winter. Absolutely. And I do the same thing with my perennials as well. Not only perennial flowers, but perennial vegetables. So my, my strawberries, my rhubarb, my horseradish, I, and my mint, my, my herbs, I, I leave them in place all winter long as well. Because some of those, particularly like the, the strawberries and the rhubarb, the crown can be damaged if it gets too cold and if it's exposed to the elements. So I let all of the dead leaves stay in place and help protect those plants. And it holds true for, for the, the echinacea and the rudbeckia and all those other perennial flowers I'm growing. Same thing. I wait until the, the spring to start clearing or cleaning them up, as Dusty Flats says, because when left in place, it's it's the way nature works, and that's what protects them through the winter. So that's a good tip, and I do appreciate that. So, hey, Frank. Hey, back to you. Thanks. Awesome Monday. Appreciate that, Frank. Hope you have a great week. Uh, Miss Lee says, burning bush is invasive. Uh, that's interesting. Here in my region, uh, burning bush is sold in the nursery, and most of the people I know have a hard time growing it. And so uh, it, it just goes to show that a weed in one area is not necessarily a weed in another area. An invasive plant in one area is not necessarily an invasive plant in another area. And a shout out to Brian Siebert. Looks like Brian gifted some channel memberships. He did that a couple months ago. Thank you, Brian. You're just an awesome guy for doing that. We have the, the, the Gardner Scott channel membership. And depending on what level your membership is, we have the Facebook page and there's lots of extra perks that, that we include on a monthly basis. And so thank you, Brian, for for being gracious and gifting the membership to some of the people that are watching today. So uh, that's fantastic. And it is a great group. They, the Facebook group in particular, it's a private group for members only, but it's fantastic, the information and the photos and the videos and everything else that's posted on that, that group. It's it's fantastic. Maddie, 2019, love this live stream. Thank you. Your videos have helped change our lives for the better. Well, thank you, I appreciate that. Growing Seminole pumpkin this season, do you intend on buying an Afro wig and doing a Bob Ross parody? You know, so I have, I do have a video. It's It's one of the videos I did with my fruit trees and I 
uh, was starting the planting, starting setting up the the uh, the bare root trees in that area. And I only had one, I think I might have had two comments on that video. And so in that video, I have a line where I talk about my happy little trees. And that was a direct link to Bob Ross. And so, yes, I have had that thought to do a follow-up video with my happy little trees with a Bob Ross wig and use even more of Bob Ross's uh, colloquialisms. So you may see that in the future. Thanks for asking because, yes, I'm aware of that. And so you can you can look up that fruit tree video and see that I reference the happy little trees and I try to do it in the same cadence as Bob Ross. So that may be coming. We'll see. I'll, I'll have to do more thought on that. If I come across a wig, I actually haven't looked for one. I've thought about it. But if I come across a Bob Ross wig, I may just go ahead and get it and move that process along a little bit better or a little bit faster, we should say. So uh, that's funny you say that. Wormala says, spiders are normally fine if they get bigger than the palm of my hand. However, if they're hiding, I'm afraid I'll scare them. They'll scare me. It won't be symbiotic anymore. Uh, absolutely. In fact, you raise a good point. I've talked about this a few times in the past. Spiders in the garden are a good thing because they're dealing with some of those insect pests. And pretty much any spider that you see in your garden is a good spider. It's a happy spider. My my daughter loves seeing the spiders in her house and she'll let them maintain their webs because they will trap the mosquitoes and the gnats and all those other annoying insects. If you can see it, it's probably a good spider. It's those spiders that you don't see. It's the brown recluse and it's the black widow that hide behind rocks or underneath logs. And those are the ones that can pose issues. And yes, when I'm working or pulling the wood from my wood pile and come across something like that, they definitely scare me and it's no longer a symbiotic relationship. And so uh, I, I like spiders in the garden, but I don't like those hidden spiders in the garden because they can pose problems. Hi, Yankee Sister Homestead. Always nice to see you here. Garner Scott, your lives have been the most amazing people around or have the most peop amazing people around. Blessings to you, Yankee Sister Homestead. Thank you. Yeah, we've been doing a lot of the, the guests in recent weeks, and I've got an, another guest that'll be popping up next week as well. So I'm glad you've been enjoying them because there, there's a lot of amazing people. Scott Head, I'm not sure if he's still on, was on the show. And uh, I've, I've gotten so many comments from so many people about that one in particular. You know, Scott, the two Scots, and uh, it's, it's enjoyable. So I like highlighting lots of the people that are on YouTube that not all of us are aware of. And so thank you for saying that because uh, I enjoy it as well. I like having those conversations. I had Enoch Graham on the show last week. And then over the weekend, I was on his live stream that, that he he's, he's starting off doing a live stream and then releases it as a podcast. And so it was his second episode this last week. And I like being part of it as well. I like having the conversations with other gardeners and sharing our stories and our experiences. So thank you for that. And we'll do more of that. As we move into the active growing season, I'll have fewer guests because I think there's just, it's easier to answer some of your questions and it's easier to talk about things like weeds and devote a whole episode to something like this with without the focus being on the guest, you know, not to not to you know take away from the guests, but it will depend on what the time of year is as to what guests I have in the future as well. But look for them. They're coming. There'll be more of them. Mr. Grimm says, how about a Bob Ross episode talking about the plants that make the pigments? You know, that that's interesting. I'd so um, I've been thinking about doing, you know, like I talked about doing something with Bob, Bob Ross. I was thinking about doing the happy little trees. I have been, it's on my list of a video that talks about using plants in artwork. Uh, 
and how you can make your own dyes and how you can use the plants for like watercolors. And I hadn't actually thought about putting those two together. So Mr. Grimm 13, thank you for that idea. That's actually, um, I'll have to start thinking about that because that would be very creative and would achieve both of the purposes that I've already thought about. I just hadn't thought about putting them together. So don't you love the creativity of everybody else when when you're trying to be creative and someone else pops out something like that that's the ultimate in creativity? I love it. I absolutely love it. And so I'll try to remember to give you credit if I if I make that video, but if I forget to, I apologize in advance. But that's 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 awesome. I really like that idea. Salty Beach Scrapper, thank you so much for teaching me so much about gardening. Well, you're very welcome. I'm almost ready to start my first garden in South Florida, Zone 10A. Good for you. And so cheers to Salty Beach Scrapper for doing the first garden. The first garden can be the, the most challenging because for many of us, and this is the way I am, we want, we want everything to go right and we do the research and we watch Gardener Scott videos and we get ourselves worked up and it's hard to, to get that first seed in the ground. It's hard to transplant that first plant because you're just so concerned that things are going to go wrong. Don't be concerned that things are going to go wrong. Just do it. And, and I try to tell that to new gardeners as much as possible. Don't worry at all about how the season is going to turn out. It's awesome that you're starting your garden and that you're going to just do it. And it becomes a great educational opportunity and a lot of fun along the way, hopefully. So I'm uh, glad to hear that. But first gardens at the end of the season often don't turn out the way you hope. And this, this is one of the ways that I classify people as gardeners. If you start off gardening and it just is too hard and it didn't turn out the way you thought it was going to be and you quit, well, then you're not a gardener. You're just a person who planted some plants. But if you get to the end of the first season and hopefully have lots of successes, but even if you have some of those failures, if you do it again next year, now you're a gardener and you're probably going to be hooked and you're going to keep doing it from that point forward. So have fun with it. Enjoy it. Don't worry about it. Just have a gardener and become a gardener next year. Good luck. And I, I, I look forward to you telling us in future chats how well it turned out. D. Birdwell, thank you for that super sticker. I appreciate the, the support. I appreciate you being here. And there's Tony from Simplify Gardening. How are you, Tony? I was on Tony's live stream on Friday. So I actually had a pretty busy week last week being on on. Uh, different events. I, I taught a class to a group in Florida on Thursday and I was on Tony's live stream on Friday and I was on Enix podcast on Saturday and now we're doing this on Monday. Great to have you here, Tony. And uh, I had put a link to that on my community page. So if you want to see a chat between Tony and me, and like I, was, I just mentioned with Enix, I love chatting with Tony. So we're going to be doing more stuff in the future, of course. And Tony's got a book that'll be coming out one of these days soon. So you can expect to see Tony here when that happens, because the last book was fantastic. And I have no doubt that this next book will be fantastic as well. So always nice to, to have Tony on. And uh, I guess Tony's at work. So uh, t Tony is a a firefighter and has long shifts and so it's one of those kind of jobs that, that there's time I guess on Mondays to join us but not always because you never know he may have to leave us and go to work real work so I have to wait and see what happens there so hope you have a quiet day Tony warm fuzzy vibes oops a leaf cutter bee on a rose leaf not petal early spring and the roses are full of new leaves so this is one of those things I I didn't see them last year and I was actually a little disappointed by that but I love leaf cutter bees leaf cutter bees are solitary bees they're great pollinators they cut little circles out of the leaf to build their nests and this is one of those things when we talk gardening where we have to do a trade-off do you want your perfect leaves with no holes cut in them or do you want to support the wildlife 
and allow those bees to survive because the bees will actually benefit the roses and all the other flowers and your garden in general. So um, it's it's a you can always cut off the leaf if you don't like the look of it, but uh, I I like seeing those holes in my leaves because it shows that I'm really developing that balance of nature and that those solitary bees have found a home in my garden. So uh, I had them on uh, lilacs last year actually, and uh, I'm looking forward or not last year two years ago. I really didn't see much last year. So. Uh, but I, I, I love the leafcutter bees. I'm, I'm hoping that we get some more of them. Yeah, there's Scott saying leafcutter bees are awesome. Unfortunately, the ones I brought into my yard did not thrive. Now the tube nests are filled with other critters. Oh, sorry to hear that. So, yeah, I think that made a difference. A couple years ago, I made uh, my bee hotel. And that year, I had leafcutter bees. And last year, I didn't add more of the, the logs with the holes cut in them. And I didn't see the leaf cutters reappear. So, uh, yeah, I agree with you, Scott. They are awesome. So I, I want to point out, some of you may have noticed it in the, the thumbnail, but this is my 150th live stream. I know, it's crazy. But it was three years ago. It was March 9th of 2020 that we did the first live stream. And some of you, I know have been along for the entire journey. And I just want to say thank you for sticking with me for three years as we move along this journey and as we talk gardening every Monday. But this is another one of those things that just blows my mind. It's been three years that we've been getting together every Monday. And I love it. And I plan on for at least another three years or three decades. Who knows how much time we're going to have together. But this this is fun, and I sincerely appreciate you being here on Monday. For some of you, like Scott Head, it's Monday morning. For others, like Tony O'Neill, it's Monday afternoon. And there are some of you in Australia that it's Tuesday morning right now. And so it's just fantastic that we can all get together on a weekly basis and just be a bunch of gardeners that are hanging out and talking about leaf cutter bees and weeds and all the other wonderful topics that we we have on a weekly basis so i i look forward to more time with you but i do really want to highlight the time that we've had and the guests and the discussion and all the information that's passed back and forth over all of this time and 150 is just a number three years is just an amount of time but it is one of those things that what there are certain numbers that that just stand out i remember when we did the hundredth episode which was just about a year ago and i'll probably say something on the 200th episode a year from now because they're just easy numbers to highlight what we've accomplished and we've accomplished a lot like some of the questions that we've answered today and some of the comments that some of you have made that you're starting a garden and you're starting a garden in zone 10 florida which is completely different than zone 5 colorado but that's not important the important aspect is that we are on this journey together and that we can share information and that we can share enthusiasm and that we can be part of a community that i think is fantastic this global community of gardeners had someone ask uh, what what I meant by global gardeners and sure I can look at the analytics and there are some weeks that when I look at the analytics and YouTube allows me to show countries that the viewers are from we've had live streams with 24 25 I think at one point I saw 28 different countries all together watching this live stream not necessarily everybody participating but everybody's here you don't have to make a comment you don't have to ask a question to be part of this community so when we have two dozen countries from around the world represented yeah i think i can easily say that this is a global audience and we are global gardeners because we're sharing this experience we're sharing this moment 
on this day. And I just think that's incredible. So you have my gratitude for being part of this. And I, I thank you for being a welcome part of my world because it's Monday and the weather's pretty good. And I'm going to go outside with Mala and do some garden cleanup because it's about that time of year for me to be focusing on that. And every time I do that on a Monday, I just have that boost of energy and that enjoyment from you all that helps me through the day and the week until we do this again next Monday. So thanks for being here. Thank you for everything you give me in this gardening journey. And let's do it again next Monday. Hopefully we'll see you here. Maybe some new people will pop up and we'll start more gardening journeys for people everywhere. Have a great gardening week and we'll see you next Monday. I'm Gardner Scott. Enjoy gardening.